Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gregg. This evening's program, we're going to spend talking about four American realist artists, realism of different, differing degrees, Andrew Wyeth, Edward Hopper, Ben Sean, and Jack Levine. We'll try to compare and contrast their uh, styles, their point of view, what they're trying to express in their paintings, their attitudes, and uh, if we feel brave, try to uh, assess their level as artists, their achievements as artists. Andrew Wyeth's Christina's World <clears throat> is probably the picture most known by everyone and perhaps was the first picture of his to gain wide attention, wide fame, and for the Museum of Modern Art to purchase the picture or to have it in its collection uh, says something about the impact this picture had on society and in the media, because this is not exactly the style of picture that the Museum of Modern Art uh, collects, as, as you well know. Uh, painted in 1948, we look at it and we can ask ourselves, what are the qualities of the picture? What, what is it trying to tell us? And what is there about it that, that captured uh, the imagination of so many people? Well, probably the extreme meticulous realism of the picture, uh, number one, people are uh, love detail in pictures and uh, realism. Uh, the more photographic, the better to the average viewer of art, although that doesn't necessarily make it uh, quality art. But also the sense of, of, of longing, of yearning, uh, the, the desire to reach those distant houses, and probably the one to the right of, of this one, is the goal that Christina seeks to attain. Sprawled out in the field, uh, Christina is uh, a crippled woman. She had polio uh, at one point and the diagonal line from her to the building is the track of her desired movement. Her hands literally seem to walk in the place of legs that cannot. We see some of the detail of the grass. We see the detail of wrinkles of her rather bony arms, the hair somewhat askew, somewhat blowing in the wind. And I think it's these, these qualities, this sense of, 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 of being lost, of wanting to attain something, is such a universal human need that this picture became so well known. There is this sense of, of loneliness, of isolation in Wyeth's pictures. It will run like a light motif through, through most of the works. And loneliness and isolation similarly runs through the work of Edward Hopper. Wyeth, still alive, must be um, nearing 60. Hopper, dead for uh, 20 or more uh, years. In his house by the railroad track, Hopper paints a house solidly, but not quite as meticulously as Wyeth. It's blocky. One, one almost senses the uh, influence of, of Cubism in some of, of Hopper's works, although he is unabashedly and uncompromisingly a realist painter. But just the sharp edges of the light edge of a facade versus the dark. And 
Of course, in terms of content, it's the extreme moodiness of the pictures. The windows seem almost like eyes or mouths. The porch, perhaps a mouth, seems to gape with its uh, tiger teeth pillars <clears throat> so that the whole picture seems to resonate with a haunted, melancholy, darker quality. And, and Hopper did have those qualities of character. We sense the passing of an age here, something being left behind, the railroad track, the railroad, the train never passes on this track any longer. Some people have spoken of the tracks being literally red with rust and, and disuse. But this, as we've stated before, is a self-portrait by Hopper. Whenever we see a single isolated object, the artist is painting a picture of himself, and it's literally a haunted house. Ben Sean, Sean's pictures vary in quality. This one called Vacant Lot, painted in 1939. Sean has been dead a number of years now as well. <clears throat> uh, uh, this picture, in its emptiness, seems to speak of, of hopelessness, of empty lives, of bleakness, uh, perhaps in urban existences, as the child in a vacant lot with scattered bricks, not a child, perhaps, perhaps a young, young man, seems to bat a ball against the wall. Sean is a strong social commentator and will often be very harsh and vituperative against a, so what he considers to be social injustice. The, this picture is, is very quiet, very melancholy, very low-key, nearly abstract. Perhaps we can pull out even farther on it <clears throat> so that we get the true sense of, of scale of the tiny little figure lost in the immensity of the wall and the lot. It's nearly an abstraction, really, divided diagonally through the lower center. There's no way out of this environment, as Sean projects it. Just two years earlier, Jack Levine will personify the hopelessness of the environment, the urban environment, the corruption that's involved in a picture called The Feast of Pure Reason where the police on the left, a crime or gambling interests in the center, and government on the right join together in an unholy trinity to line their own pockets. We see the policeman casually examining his nails, the gambler <clears throat> stolidly smoking his cigarette, and the man of City Hall uh, accepting and living with his uh, bribe money, his cuts, his extortion, sitting around a, a silver decanter, the feast of pure reason, a, a, a bit of sour humor on Levine's part that it's an extremely rational activity. They're using their reason to their limits and it's all for dishonest purposes. Levine often has a, <clears throat> a very bitter, uh, savage feeling in his pictures, <clears throat> excuse me, at least his uh, social commentary pictures. Uh, he seems to be uh, a rather bitter individual. And that finds expression in works like these. But we must say that there is a completely different side to Levine's work that we won't look at tonight, Old Testament biblical subjects painted with much, uh, with much greater care and uh, a less savage handling of the paint and, and certainly with a, a feeling of, of reverence for his subject. If we look at Wyeth's uh, picture called The Hunter, we, we see some of his underlying despair in, in such uh, of life in such a picture. The tree reaches out toward us, as we've spoken before, so that we are out on a limb, literally. We are the prey that's in the tree. 
And in the lower right center of the picture, we see the small hunter dwarfed by the tree. The, the tree seeming to be almost a tree of life in a sense, that it, it, it exists beyond and above the small death-dealing activities of mankind, that life will go on, but still there is the sense of danger of, from our fellow man that we as the animal, the squirrel, the whatever, the bird, have to crouch in the tree and try to hide from our fellow man. This is something of Andrew Wyeth's uh, pessimism, the <clears throat> negativity that comes from his picture. Sometimes it's simply loneliness, a certain pointlessness, a certain despair. Compare the hunter with another kind of hunting, painted in 1950, called Soaring. And, and look at our viewpoint here. We're up in the sky with the buzzards who circle and wing and wheel above the little house down below. And of course, that's our house. That's your house. That's my house. That's humanity's house down there. And humanity is dying or is in danger of dying and near death. And the buzzards circle and hover over our little dwelling as they would over some lost traveler struggling in the desert. This is a pessimistic view, obviously. There's a certain uh, and you know a, a sense of, of detail in the near foreground objects, which brings the buzzard close to us, and, and a generalization of handling of the distant ground below. Even in a picture painted in 1957 called Brown Swiss, which seems simply an incredibly sensitive, realistic rendition of a house, uh, a tremendous tension is created in the picture simply through the allotment of space. The way the house is, is spread to the far left of the picture and it plays against the immense space on the right, as does its reflection in the pond below. So that, so that uh, it's a picture that literally zooms back and forth from left to right. Uh, Wyeth is incredibly sensitive to uh, visual reality, we might almost say photographic reality. Some of his pictures don't have a tremendous sense of, of, of density, of, of form and substance, but in rendering appearances, as we see the reflection, uh, Wyeth really has no peer in contemporary painting. Not painted from photographs, as so many of the photo realist paintings are, it retains a certain sense of the environment and the locale. And in his picture, Tenant Farmer, painted in 1961, we see again that, uh, that sense of, of loneliness, of emptiness, of isolation, uh, a, a hint of morbidity in the, obviously, in the hanging deer that has been shot by the tenant living in the old dilapidated house, but the house itself is stark and dark and seemingly empty, uninhabited, uninhabitable. The snow falls, misting out all around the building and the tree and the deer, so that the deer hanging from the symbolic tree of life, the tree in the Garden of Eden, the tree of immortal life, is dead. Only the fruit that hangs from the tree is dead, is death. Emptiness. And a lack of fulfillment. The little windows in the building. Hollow, empty. Again, like a little eye. We sense an emotional, psychological presence in all of the elements of the picture. We, we sense Andrew Wyeth in the picture, his own personality, a withdrawn, shy man, and possibly a lonely man who 
lives with the people he paints who will stay with him. Uh, he's not antisocial as, as such. He, he, paint, he has painted a lot of people, but at least in terms of presenting himself on the public stage, very reticent. But in the picture coming up, we'll see a tremendous difference in spirit. And, and frankly, this is the only picture I can think of of Andrew Wyeth, and or, you know, readily admitting that I'm not totally acquainted with everything he's painted. Picture called The Patriot, painted in 1964. We see a sense of indomitable optimism being expressed in the figure of the man, the expression of the man, uh, rather smiling. Uh, uh, the Patriot, meaning that he is a veteran of World War I. When Wyeth was painting him, they swapped dirty jokes. So, so we've been told, or at least the, the Patriot uh, told dirty jokes, and, and he seems the salt of the earth kind of man who would enjoy that, would enjoy a little bit of the, uh, uh, a little drink now and then, and wouldn't turn away from a pretty girl. He wears his World War I uniform. Uh, we can, if you see, look closely at it, you, see, you can actually see the tufting of the material as Wyeth responds incredibly to it, and of course, wears his medals with pride as he wears his uniform. Quite a different feeling in the painting that uh, very well known, and we've seen before on the program called Carl, where Carl seems threatened by the hook above his head. The expression in his face is one of threat. The crack leads down into his head. And the hair line on the left seems to continue the crack down into the face, in a sense. And th this is the Wyeth that we know, the, one, the Wyeth where curtains blow into empty rooms, shells stand solitarily on tabletops, weather vanes exist on the top of silvered, aged barn shingled roofs, Broken boats lie alone beside the sea. Water buckets will never be picked up. Egg scales. And in a painting like Miss Olson, 1952, this is the Christina Olsen from Christina's World, seeming to have put on a little bit of, of weight in the four years since that painting. Christina looks at her cat as one of Renoir's girls looked at her cat in an earlier program. Christina seems almost to doze as the cat dozes on her apparently ample bosom. Their heads point toward one another, linking them with the obvious suggestion that Christina doesn't get out very much, doesn't see very many people, lives a rather lonely, isolated life. That wonderfully descriptive profile with the hooked nose and the downturned mouth. The battered walls of her room divided in nearly in an abstract way, somewhat reminiscent of Sean's vacant lot, although divided vertically. Worn objects, used objects, painted with a, uh, a great deal of integrity and honesty, according to Wyeth's own personal particular vision. Loneliness.
Loneliness again in Edward Hopper's painting Gas, painted in 1940 at the Museum of Modern Art. Like the house by the railroad. This man probably will never ever get another customer again. Stands tending his pumps as if they were some ritualistic objects, some object of habit that he's done for years and years and he continues to do despite the fact that no one will ever come. The handling of the painting much less detail than Wyeth's in terms of minute detail, but detailed enough certainly in the handling of the painting. Forms very, very substantial. Probably Hopper gets much, much more uh, solidity of form in his painting. The black recessive darkness of the tree line going back behind the uh, mobile gas sign and, and the building uh, is a tremendous a building of space as these pumps protrude from it, the perspective movement back into it. And as we've mentioned before, the rising out of that dead end darkness, the darkness of no return is that sign with the flying horse on it, which of course is, is a tremendous symbol, is, is a symbol of uh, uh, a combination of the spirit and the body rising up, flying up to heaven and the light in the sky. So, but, but there's still uh, the, sen the overwhelming sense of the picture is of, uh, of light and darkness and of, of isolation. And this expresses Hopper's uh, state in life uh, very accurately. He, he was married. But, but his wife seems to have been a, a somewhat aggressive, uh, perhaps somewhat insensitive individual, insensitive to Hopper's sensitivity, so that uh, it was the, the quiet, uh, melancholy uh, recluse in Hopper uh, marrying a, a louder, a harsher, more extroverted type, perhaps more critical type uh, of woman and uh, perhaps the blending of the two opposites uh, provided uh, ample satisfaction. Hopper's uh, painting New York Movie in 1939, also at the Museum of Modern Art, is a study of loneliness again, of course. The usher on the far right, lost in her thoughts with her flashlight tucked under her arm, very few members in the audience looking at the movie on the screen at the left, separated visually and design-wise from the woman, from the usherette by the pillar, the architectural pillar. And the stairway to the right of the usherette leading up to perhaps some place where her fantasy or dream life or her desires will lead her. The dividing pillar, cutting the picture in two, in the two areas, not cutting it artificially in two, beautifully linked by the, the backs of the chairs in the foreground, but two different worlds, the world of the girl and her thoughts and her desires and the world of make-believe on the left, which obviously doesn't fulfill her at this point, and obviously wouldn't in Usherette, who's seen the movie anyway about 57 times. But this quiet, rather gentle melancholy in Hopper, the level of this is raised to one of, of, of outrage in a work by Ben Shaw in 1931 at the Whitney Museum, The Passion of Sacco and Vanzetti. Two immigrants, we don't quite get the other fellow in his coffin, lying dead at the bottom of the picture, generally agreed that they were railroaded, they were immigrants, railroaded. They were anarchists politically, 
and railroaded by the bureaucracy of the time, convicted of the murder of, uh, I'm not sure if it was a bank robbery or other robbery, convicted of a murder, and they were both executed. The figure standing above them seeming to pretend to grieve in mock grieving over what they've done are members of the government and the educational establishment who failed to uh, do anything to save these two people. And above them, further symbols of, of government, the steps of uh, the capitals or courtrooms or city halls, a, a judge or official taking an oath either in picture or seen through a window, apparently a picture, and, and other symbols of government. In 1961, Sean's liberation, similarly a picture of social disgust. Liberation for what? The kids swing around the maypole, the symbol of life, as the world falls down around them. Similarly, uh, cynical and angry is Jack Levine in 1963 in a picture called The Witch's Sabbath. And this is a picture painted to attack the McCarthy hearings, the communist hearings. And Senator McCarthy is at the top center with his lawyer Roy Cohn on the right and symbolic figures of the Ku Klux Klan, congressmen, and various other uh, patriotic groups surround the two central figures, talking about right-wing restriction and repression. To the lower left, we see a goat called the Judas goat, who is put in there to symbolize uh, a Judas goat leads lambs, innocent sheep, to the slaughter. It simply uh, is, is one part of the hired help that Lee at slaughterhouses. And, and people follow the bell, the lambs follow the bell to the slaughter. So this is any, symbolizes anyone who helped the committee to persecute innocent people in the witch hunt of that time. So the, all four of these artists express a certain discontent with the time discontent with the society of the time, uh, a certain sense of loss or longing, a certain sense of, of uh, melancholy, and perhaps that's the, the story of our age. It has been far from a happy one. Program is Artisan Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks for being with me. Bye-bye.